Okay, so here we have the Arc Fault Simulator, which Eaton have kindly lent us to use for a little bit. We have the IC Hawk supply point in here. We have some overcurrent protection here, voltage indicator there. And then here we have a series of devices. So this way, we'll switch the device to just an MCB for overcurrent protection only. Here we'll incorporate an RCBO, which will introduce earth leakage protection as well. Then over here is when we then introduce the arc fault detection device, which should encompass all of these protections plus the arc fault protection. This other selector switch here switches between the arc fault test or over to this direction for a leakage test to verify the disconnection of the leakage settings. Down here, when we do an arc fault test, we have a little contact, which I will give a, a closer view of, which just closes the gap and creates an arc. Now, straight out of the kit, we can actually see arcs because we have a load here, and this is this little lamp. Um, but then we have this socket here where we can introduce a much larger load. And this really helps us to understand where the AFDDs really are needed and what kind of equipment, like this lamp here, the AFDD isn't really going to do any benefit for us whatsoever. So let's connect this in and see how it plays. And we are right now selected the RCBO. This is a steady light, it's just flickering due to the, the camera there. MCB protection, RCBO protection, and your AFDD. It's going through the cycles and then giving us the green light to say that it's still suitable for use. First thing I'll do is I'll just give them a test, for, uh, verify their work. RCBO as well. And I obviously don't have that freedom with the MCB. So let's go to the arc test. And with just this smaller load connected, we'll see that running the test, if I open this up, you'll see a breaking connection, but we don't have an arc that we could consider to be one worthy of actually worrying about. There is a slight spark, but that's the point here. There's a difference between sparks and arcs. RCBO, same thing. We're gonna have some minor sparks, but no arcs. And the AFDD. So again, we have tiny little sparks. We don't really have accomplished arcs on this. So what's the issue? The issue is the nature of the demand here is quite negligible. Because there's such a small demand, there's insufficient power or you know electrons to jump through this gap and actually create an arc. So what we need to do is apply a larger load. And this does raise questions to when AFDDs should be used, and it's definitely with larger loads. Now this load I've got here is a domestic iron. It's not a heater, not a powerful heater, but it's an iron that is up to two kilowatts. So it'll put a load on this. Let's go back to the MCB test. If we look here, there's a much more accomplished or easier to spot arc occurring when we open this gap, but the device has not done anything. Go to the RCBO, same thing. The arc is occurring, the device is not having it, it doesn't really respond at all. Let's go to the AFDD. So now the iron is gonna switch on, the AFDD is selected. And let's just see what we get here. Well, 
that's pretty much a success. But let's just check that again. Barely any time. So what's happening is the larger iron is pulling a pretty sustained load through. And when that results in arcing, the duration of the arc, or the sustained arc, if you want to call it, is what creates the thermal effect, which creates the risk of fire. So it's only when larger demands, like equipment that heats up or equipment that draws more power, it's only when they really start to arc that there's a sustained arc. If we have constant breaking of a, of a distance, that's just going to be um, a sparking across a gap. What we want is obviously to have a constant arc shortening across a gap, and that sustained arc, which we've got with these larger loads, is what actually creates this risk, and is what these devices are protecting against. So again, barely seeing anything. Right, let's remember if I put the RCBO into action, so the RCBO now. So you can see the actual arcing occurring. So this just shows exactly why the AFDD has been developed, what it's for. And if it's selected for the right purpose, for the right application, it's a good toy. It's a very good device. Um, yeah. All right. Let's uh, let's do some overview talking about this now. Okay. So what can we take from this? Well, it's clearly evident that when a arc occurs, the device operates. So why do we believe this won't really work in the real time scenario? And the, probably the biggest misunderstanding and the biggest misinterpretation is the difference between a spark and an arc. So when we have a poor connection, what we end up with is a series of many, many contacts that are made but broken straight away when cables break or connections are very loose. Okay, This is designed to identify when an actual connection sustains that arcing connection. So instead of actually breaking and making and breaking and making, it actually has a level where You'll have some plasma actually leaking across and bridging a gap. And it's when we have the arc occur that we then have the thermal effect because that sustained period of time there will be a buildup of heat or temperature. So, some of the frustrations for AFDDs to operate, we know that they have to have at least two and a half amp currents. So, if a series arc was to occur for a circuit of less than that, then there's going to be insufficient current for the device to perform. It needs to have three things. It needs to see the patterns of this arc. It needs to see the current to achieve two and a half amp or more. And it needs to be there for a period of time. Then the device will work. So there has been obviously some confusion when there's suggestions that these devices should be installed in switch drops, which, in, you know, unless, you know, for some uh, fairly few cases, there'd be nowhere near two and a half amp in a switch drop. So we do need to be a bit more sensible with our selection decisions for AFDDs, and I think that's probably one of the biggest problems. Um, you know, we kind of want to be told yes or no, or, or the regulations say, you know, or sleeping accommodation, or risk of this and risk of that. Um, but if we understand the actual operating properties, it makes deciding whether to use these devices or not for any final circuit a lot simpler. So we are looking at circuits that are going to pull more than 2.5 amp, uh, with risks of, you know, the deleterious effects of the fire as regarded in the regulations as a result. So, in the domestics, you maybe, yeah, maybe for your uh, immersion, your cooker, your heating, your ring finals, yes, light circuits, maybe, maybe, maybe not, maybe not. Um, with regards to the ring final as well, there's that confusion as to, you know, they don't work on ring finals. The proper, the, the performance characteristics for the series arc requires, obviously, the, the electrons to try to jump across a gap. And obviously, if there is a ring final circuit, there's the other way around. So, yes, they do not work for series arcs on ring finals. But it's not that the AFDDs don't work on ring finals. It's actually the ring finals aren't suitable for the AFDDs. Because the phenomena that is required for the AFDD to perform 
just doesn't occur in finals because of that other way round. So it's not it's not really a good thing to say, although you know, AFDDs don't work on ring finals. It's more that the the stupidity of the of the ring finals arrangement creates a phenomenon that doesn't you know that, that doesn't create a series arc because of the alternative way around the circuit. So you know it's important to get that across as well. Having played with this at some length and having obviously um, spoke to the guys with E5, um, Eaton were very good in opening up and being transparent with E5 and allowing them to travel over to Vienna, where we saw some behind the scenes sections and some of the some of the very clever people there. And we looked at the oscilloscopes and we were seeing how the actual current is a duration of time to equate to a temperature. It made a lot more sense. Unfortunately, a lot of this information isn't allowed in the public domain due to, obviously, you know, um, property and, uh, you know, private and all that, st all, that uh, all that stuff. Now, moving forward then, um, I could say that AFDDs are um, a good device. I could say I AFDDs are a reliable device and that they do work. But they work for certain criteria, and I think that's not what's been passed across to electricians enough. So we've come to a come we've come to a level agreement now where we're kind of saying yes, 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 yes. The AFDDs are a good thing. They are going to work. They are going to do their job. Um, and you know, technology has moved on, and it's creating solutions to problems that shouldn't exist but do exist. Um, but they've not been explaining it effectively enough to electricians as to how the device works and what the device does yeah we're um we're not we're not passing that across enough and we've had some good discussions with um with eaton we also went to electrium we went to electrium and they were very transparent with us as well and we had a good a good few hours of uh debating about um you know scenarios and you know moving these things forward um it went very very well and, and we've both kind of learned from that but uh, yeah, to um, close off my opinion, um, it's a frustrating technology because it's a technology that creates a solution to a problem that shouldn't exist, um, but it does. And because it exists, um, yeah, more, 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 more power to it. But we must know how it works and in what circumstances it is designed to work. And that is, again, the circuit must have more than two and a half amp. It must have a period of time for the arc and it must be a certain pattern of arc. Okay, so they're not really a every circuit decision. And I think that's that's what we really need to kind of get um, get across is that some circuits are fine, some circuits are fine without them, some circuits would be more protected with them. Um, I'd say that's probably about where I'd go with that. I'd like to thank Eaton, obviously, for lending us the gear, and E5, obviously, my part of E5 is always... Um, always rewarding for me but obviously the, the you know the boys give me some private time with this just to kind of explore it um and electrium for opening up the doors to e5 for us to pop in and uh had a good time talking with you guys um moving forward yeah uh let's just get some single module ones fairly quick <laughs> 